Really uh, delighted to share this work with you. Uh, thanks, uh, Ted and Steve, for facilitating it. I'm uh, presenting with my colleague, Scott Bacorny, who is responsible for, for the hydrologic modeling done uh, with my supervision. Uh, we, we hope it's a contribution to the great work that's going on throughout the basin. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I do want to make a few acknowledgements here. Firstly, to the Commission, we are very grateful that the Commission exists and facilitates these cross-border conversations because I have historically learned a lot from my American colleagues in the process and my Canadian colleagues as well. Uh, particularly, I want to uh, acknowledge the, the historic work of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the HEC HMS uh, hydrologic modeling framework, which I believe we've mastered. Uh, and we're now in the process of, uh, of uh, comparing and contrasting with other hydrologic modeling frameworks, but there is no doubt that HEC HMS is a, is a massive contribution to the field of hydrologic science. Uh, another acknowledgement uh, to the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources and their uh, their um, uh, contribution of PTM app, uh, and as well, Zach Kerman was on this session and his his uh, company's work uh, bringing PTM app to the people. Um, I'll uh, have a little bit more to say about PTM app uh, further on. And again, another historical uh, contribution should be acknowledged from the International Water Institute, which uh you know has done historically such tremendous work uh bringing lidar processing uh to the people and we've been inspired by all of that and so on the canadian side the context is we see this great work going on in the states and we kind of you know um stroke our chin so to speak and and figure out how we can meet that standard utilizing the resources we have on the canadian side in some creative fashion to perhaps meet the bar set by American colleagues and occasionally maybe even raise the bar. So I have to acknowledge uh, um, our partners on the Canadian side as well, uh, particularly the Global Water Futures Program, which is uh, centered at the, um, the University of Saskatchewan. Um, and uh, uh, we're an industry partner in something called the Integrated Modeling Program for Canada, where things like uh, hydrologic modeling comparisons between HEC HMS and other modeling frameworks takes place. And we've been involved in exactly that for the Red River Basin. A funding partner, the Winnipeg Metro Region, which is trying to do, trying to build a plan for... Sorry? Um, I'm going to continue. Um, the... Um, Natural Resources, uh, or sorry, uh, National Research Council, Industrial Research Assistantship Program. Uh, uh, great uh, funding for our research and development. Uh, the commission, of course, um, you know, the the uh, just a quick comment on the commission. Um, it's another it's another cross border collaboration. That the really interesting work presented by uh, by uh, Zach and Chad just now. Uh, these are kinds. Of, this is new era. Uh, I would call it ecological engineering to some to some significant degree. The the idea of this uh, multifunctional storage, multi-benefit storage, uh, and I just want to you know, acknowledge that uh, that on our side we continue to do work in the Netley Marsh Re Revitalization Program, which is uh, you know a Canadian attempt to to really do some leading edge ecological engineering in the mouth of the Red River. So I was fortunate enough to tour that project. Um, in the fall and uh, so impressed by the work of Steve and uh, Rebecca in, in leading that uh, that project. Um, just a quick mention, um, uh, Agriculture Canada, Environment Canada, our funding partners, project partners, Manitoba, province of Manitoba has really made a massive contribution with the uh, acquisition of the one meter LIDAR for uh, all of uh, municipal Manitoba and basically all of the Red River Basin uh, now and and steve should take some credit in making sure it all got done um just gonna push on to why we're doing hydrologic modeling here and um i think the uh the message is we do it because the science is correct and since these global climate models first became available in 1970 they've been right 
uh, you know, there's, they're not 100%, right? Nothing is 100%, right? But over the decades, they've only improved. But they've been basically right since the beginning because the thermodynamics of the atmosphere are well understood. The basic physics of how the atmosphere works are well understood. And when we put greenhouse gases into that atmosphere, we trap heat. Um, just a some of this work has been described. We know we're projected to have a much hotter climate. Uh, I believe uh, Nicole Armstrong mentioned how many more hot days we're seeing already. We're projected to get many, many, many more very hot days. Over 40 days of plus 30 degrees temperatures in our part of the Northern Great Plains. Um, precipitation is um, a different story. It's a little more mixed, but there are some key messages here. Um, all global climate models agree that we're getting much hot, hotter. Uh, more variable precipitation. Uh, some models, most models say we'll get a little more precipitation. Not all, but most say a little more, but more variable for sure. Important concept is that heat dominates. Uh, we're going to see thirstier crops, soils, and atmosphere. And although we'll have occasionally intense, episodic, almost monsoonal precipitation events, this will generate less runoff on average as moisture disappears into cracks in the ground and back to the atmosphere. Um, so what does all that mean? That's just sort of a little primer. What does this mean for Red River Basin hydrology? Um, well, what it means is we can now take advantage of uh, new global data sets and create a seamless model, a seamless model of the entire Red River Basin with no line at the border, leveraging these new gridded data products um, uh, the, uh, um, from various institutes, Globe Snow from the Finnish Meteorologic Institute, uh, uh, evapotranspiration data from the Freie Universität uh, Amsterdam, uh, new global gridded data products that we've become aware of through our participation in the Global Water Futures program as an industry partner. So also a shout out to the work of John Pomeroy at the University of Saskatchewan, uh, leading the Global Water Futures program for almost a decade. We are taking advantage of some of that distilled uh, uh, knowledge in, in terms of these gridded data sets and methods for processing. Um, okay, so cutting to the chase, um, we have, Scott has uh, produced a seamless Red River hydrologic model, no line at the border. With So all of these sub-basins are modeled in HEC HMS using these gridded data products. And we're getting very good calibration uh, KGE scores. That's the Kling Gupta efficiency score. It's a standard statistical metric for calibrating and validating hydrologic models. So we're getting everywhere high KGE scores uh, using these new uh, gridded data products. Um, there was, I, I um, wanted to acknowledge the work of the USGS this morning and, and some discussion about. Uh, snow accumulation, snow water equivalent modeling. Um, we have a daily time step uh, snow accumulation, SWE, uh, sub-process running in these uh, HEC HMS models and we're getting good results. And I have promised that I would turn the presentation over to Scott Bacorny, my colleague, to elaborate a little bit on how we're doing uh, the snow modeling. So Scott, if you could be unmuted, just to speak to this slide a little bit. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Hank. Um, so I wanted to make a, a couple quick notes about this. So uh, I heard that there was, um, or I, I actually saw that there was uh, some discussion about the, the snow routines um, in the Red River and so the way we've set this up is actually at a daily time step with a temperature index model. So basically this uh, takes into account how many days uh, above zero or below zero there are to determine when snow should accumulate or when it should be uh, melting and how fast it should be melting. So we have that little graph uh, at the bottom left 
Um, and it, it kind of shows that we get the timing right, we get the, the accumulation right. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be exactly the same because um, we're using different precipitation inputs and we can only uh, accumulate snow when there actually is precipitation occurring. Um, but I wanted to point out that the temperature index method is a little bit um, debated in the literature as to how accurate it can actually reach. Um, and I wanted to point out that while we're presenting these results, we're actually working on methods to do a full radiation-based method. Um, so this will include things such as incoming solar radiation for um, earlier melts or melt timing shifts. Um, and so we'll be consistently updating these um, results and we hope to even get uh, a little bit better than this, although these are very strong results as they are uh, and we have been able to validate the, the temperature index model itself. Thanks, Scott. Um, so I'll proceed um, and um, I'll go back to, uh, well, just jumped ahead here. So. Um, this is a hydrograph, an example hydrograph for the Red River at St. Agath, which is um, just at the southern edge of the Winnipeg metro region. So this is, uh, <coughs> it's good, it works. And what this tells us is that we're integrating everything up to St. Agath of the entire Red River Basin. So we've got, you know, American side, Canadian side, everything's integrated at this point, or just about everything is integrated at this point and is working. So we're quite pleased with this. Um, and I would say the reason it works as well as it does is because uh, it was something I believe it was um, Rachel uh, mentioned this morning that they're also uh, uh, working with is multi-objective optimization for parameter selection. We're using these Pareto efficiency concepts to um, to select parameters for the various processes. And um, yeah, a, a lot of parameters, a surface storage parameter, 11 soil parameters, et cetera, et cetera. These are selected in this complex decision space using multi-objective optimization methods. And, and Scott uses something called Ostrich, which is a fairly well-known now um, um, uh, toolkit of, of optimization um, um, algorithms. Um, yeah, it's there are other algorithm boxes out there. Uh, we're using Ostrich. Uh, we do use something called Deep as well for other optimization problems. Um, anyway, it's it's working. Um, so I'll just continue here now. Back to this issue of climate change impacts on Red River Basin hydrology. So in the spirit of no borders, no, no 49th parallel, we opted to go with the NA Cordex uh, uh, Global Climate Model Ensemble. Um, this is seamless at the 49th parallel. It's put together by Canadian and American uh, agencies, Iowa State, University of Arizona, NCAR, and I believe it's Boulder, Colorado. Uh, Uranos, which is a, a climate research uh, agency in, in uh, Montreal, as well as uh, Université du Québec à Montréal, and the Canadian Centre for Climate Modeling and Analysis. So what we're doing, we 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 got this ensemble of NA Cordex uh, uh, GCM results and did our own um, uh, equidistant quantile mapping to bias correct these models. So we got that working. Um, and the signal then, the, the sort of integrated signal is, is intuitive in a sense. Um, as mentioned, um, uh, the precipitation plot shows uh, that most of the global climate models show a little bit more precip, some less compared to historic in red. On temperature, it's universal. All, for obvious reasons, all models are showing higher temperatures. Um, you put that into a hydrologic model, and the the temperature the the uh, the temperature signal wins. Evapotranspiration dominates, and you see that in the panels on the uh, on the right here. Evapotranspiration is universally higher across all the model projections. Uh, soil moisture is down, uh, and the snow water equivalent there on the bottom left. You see the the different traces from the different global climate models, and um, Basically, we're seeing less snowpack uh, and earlier uh, spring freshet. Um, 
you you wrap up all of that information into a kind of a volumetric analysis and you see the differences here in this uh, box and whiskers uh, plot winter we're seeing higher flows uh on average uh spring we're seeing lower summer about the same uh and and fall flows are higher um there's a uh, i guess the the there is a there is still a a, a risk of of uh there's lower risk of very high spring floods but there's also a risk of high summer floods and all that that's sort of depicted here in this uh, annual hydrograph at Santa Gaff. So most models show this uh, this um, earlier and lower uh, spring um, uh, spring flooding season. We're getting lower runoff volumes overall, lower low flow conditions. But we also see this residual risk of of summer flooding from extreme precipitation events. So it's the it's it's more variability overall. Um, less water on average, about seven percent less water on a volumetric basis, uh, and significant seasonality changes. Now. We can drill down a little further, and this is sort of the low flow analysis, the extreme low flow analysis that I think a lot of people are interested in. And this is our uh, our analysis thereof. So again, the gray lines represent the individual traces of the global climate models, with red as historical, and these are exceedance plots of uh, of flows um, at Saint Agath, April, May, June, July, August, September. So this, what you see is here in April, all climate uh, projections show a lower low flow in April. The extreme low flow becomes lower in April on the Red River at Santa Gap. Same for May, same for June, same for July, but in August and September it shifts. The, the, the extreme low flow is higher with climate change. So this is a, a consistent with the seasonality shift we're seeing. So this is, we think this is pretty big news uh, and uh, deserves discussion and collaboration on, on what this all means. Um, so, and we certainly invite collaboration. This is a key point. We think we, we've got a, we've got a, you know, an R&D agenda going forward where we're gonna now uh, um, do the analysis again using a different hydrologic modeling platform. We're into it now. We're using Raven, which is similar to HEC HMS, a bit different. And Scott can comment on, on some of the ways it's different, but we're into that project right now, basically duping these results in the spirit of model equifinality in a different modeling framework called Raven, which comes out of the University of Waterloo. Um, so I'm going to basically wrap up the Red River Basin hydrologic model exercise, the climate change analysis thereof. Hopefully we'll get some questions. I have to spend a couple of minutes talking about another project. Um, got a few minutes left. Uh, FOSS Finder. Um, this is again a direct uh, descendant of some American work, um, the PTM app. Uh, we're we are releasing a Canadian alternative to PTM app, uh, which ingests one meter lidar derived digital elevation models. And this is uh, just a this is a deck uh, title slide from a deck we did for Agriculture Canada a short while ago. Scott was involved in this project. Um, another colleague who's not on this call was uh, the key developer there. Of we uh, had some great collaboration. Uh, funding partner was Environment Canada had some validation support with PTM app through uh, IISD and uh, Red River Basin Commission through their uh, facilitation, we produced an explanatory video of what FOSS Finder is all about. Um, yeah, we've basically got this tremendous LIDAR uh, data resource available now in Manitoba, and we need tools that actually can, can ingest it and process it and uh and help make investment decisions using it and we believe that FOSS Finder is uh is a is a great uh step in this direction 
Um, just a, here's a simple example. Um, so anywhere in a watershed, you can go in and inspect. And at this point in this watershed along this little rivulet, we've got an expected 43 kilogram phosphorus load every year. And that helps you do things like design uh, uh, nutrient phyto extraction uh, cells, which is what you see here in, in this photograph drone shot. We did this with the uh, Cinnaboyne West Watershed District with funding through the Ag Canada Living Labs. Um, and what we do in those cells is, as, as Zach was describing, we harvest cattails. Um, and uh, we do that for their uh, nutrient uh, content. We try to extract the nutrients and then we use the biomass and the, the, the beneficial reuse of the biomass is, is a really important question. And we're finding all kinds of outlets, whether it be composting, whether it be uh, direct combustion as a, as a space heating fuel, or the new kid on the block is pyrolysis to create uh, biochar, which is this uh, stable form of biological charcoal that's uh, believed, well, I think there's good evidence that it accelerates soil carbon sequestration. So it's another tool in the, in the climate change battle uh, to uh, take carbon out of the atmosphere by pyrolyzing um, residual biomass and reapplying it as biochar. So we've got a project in that direction right now um, so that's a little different from the HEC HMS model, but uh, it is consistent in that us Canadian guys are, uh, are watching carefully what's going on in the States and finding ways to, uh, to, to uh, um, you know, to work uh, alongside and, and create tools that work for us in Canada. Um, so, oh, one more shout out. Uh, the harvester here. This is actually a machine that's that's manufactured in Winnipeg by MacDon, and they uh, they loaned us a great machine, a uh, high horsepower machine. We got the their their 240 horsepower unit and put a 16 foot header on it, which was one of their smallest headers because the biomass is so dense. This is the interesting thing about when you're harvesting cattails, as you folks have learned in North Ottawa, the production the yields are enormous, and you need a lot of horsepower and small swaths. To be able to bail it, and so we've we're we're uh, we're doing that, um, and I've got a, a, at least two projects in this direction right now. So we're very pleased about that, and we believe Phosfinder is going to help us strategically locate and size more of these uh, nutrient phyto extraction uh, cells. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I'm, I know we're close to time, and I'd love to take a few questions, uh, Scott. And I really would love that if we could get a few questions in. So I'm going to stop here. Oh, just to learn and download Phosfinder. I'll leave this up, uh, and uh, you can go to our webpage. That that actually that first link gets you the explanatory, uh, the fact sheet, and uh, the source code. A link to the source code on GitLab. Um, I think I'm done. I think I am done. I'll leave that up. Um, yeah, just some contact information. You can get me various ways. The website. Uh, strategic systems engineering.ca is probably the easiest. Uh, Ted and uh, Steve know how to get a hold of me too. Delighted to keep working with our American partners on all of this stuff. Okay, I'm done.